Hello everyone. On behalf of Indian National Trust for Art and Cultural Heritage Intact and the Intact Conservation Institutes, I extend a very warm welcome to our distinguished speaker, Dr. Richard Hoges, and everyone who has joined us for today's talk in the Conservation Insights 2020 lecture series. I'm Dr. Padma Rohila, Director ICI Delhi. Now to introduce our speaker, Dr. Richard Hoges is the president of the American University of Rome since 2012, although I think he retired in June, that's what I've just been informed. He studied archaeology and history at Southampton University, where he completed a doctorate on the archaeology of dark trade, or dark age trade. In 1976, he joined Sheffield University as a lecturer and launched excavations and cultural heritage projects in England and Italy at Royston Grange, Derbyshire. Monterenti in Tuscany and San Vincenzo al Volturno in Moritz. He joined the Butrin Foundation as its scientific director in 1993 and he was there till 2012 to initiate new excavation and site management strategies at the UNESCO World Heritage Site at Butrin, Albania. He is currently the principal investigator of a major EU funded project in Tuscany from 2015 to 2020. He was the director of the British School at Rome from 1998 to 1995, director of the Prince of Wales Institute of Architecture, 1996 to 98, director of the Institute of World Archaeology at the University of East Anglia from 1996 to 2007, Williams director of the University of Pennsylvania Museum of Anthropology and Archaeology from 2007 to 12. In 1996, he was a principal advisor to the Albanian Minister of Culture, Edi Rama. His books include Dark Age Economics, 1982, Mohammed Chal Magne and the Origins of Europe, 1983, Wall to Wall History, 1991, Visions of Rome, A Life of Thomas Ashby, 2000, and The Archaeology of Mediterranean Peace, Lace Making in 2016. He's general editor of Bloomsbury Debates in Archaeology and the Butrin Foundation series of monographs. He's a columnist for Current World Archaeology. In 1995, he was awarded the OBE by Her Majesty the Queen. Thank you, Dr. Richard Hodges, for accepting to be the speaker today. The title for the talk today is Conservation and a Management Planning of UNESCO World Heritage Site of Ancient Butrid, Albania. This talk will review the developing management and conservation plans for the UNESCO World Heritage Site at Butrid, Ancient Butrotum in Albania, Close to foreigners until 1991, this archaeological site in its glorious setting was inscribed into UNESCO in 1992 with no clear guidelines for either its protection or presentation. The Butrin Foundation working with national agencies over seven years between 1994 and 2001 devised the first plan which was implemented in 2001 to 2012. These have resulted in a substantial increase in tourists from 1,000 a year in 1992 to about 300,000 in 2019. The Butrin Foundation working with the Albanian American Development Foundation has now devised new plans for the decade to 2030 to sustain tourism while protecting the cultural and natural assets of this archaeological site. The new plans are a pilot project and likely to be a test case for managing and conserving major archaeological sites in the Mediterranean. Before I request Dr. Richard Hodges, may I please request all of you to mute your microphones. The questions will be taken right at the end of the session, so please keep typing those uh, in the chat box and also type in your name, organization name and email ID. We'd love to know who all has joined us. Thank you, Dr. Rogers. Hodges, over to you. Thank you very much, Padma. Thank you for the kind introduction. I hope you can hear me. I'm in upstate New York. In different than the Mediterranean. I've spent much of my career as an archaeologist working in the Mediterranean and on several occasions on great Greco-Roman sites. So in 1993, when the Butrint Foundation asked me if I would look at Butrint in southern Albania, close to Corfu, I was really attracted by the challenge, not least because I knew that we might not just undertake cutting edge archaeology in terms of Greco-Roman archaeology, but also 
look at uh, look at the strategies for turning the site into a not just a money maker for Albania but also a symbol for Albania a country that in 1993 was in a terrible state so I tried to do over the last 20 years a bit more 25 years a project which brings archaeology into the 21st century and I say that mindful of the fact that we're in the middle of a pandemic which has taken out about 20% of the gross domestic product of Italy and Greece through tourism, which is based on places like this. Uh, and we've got to be mindful of how we manage these places in a new era because they are so important to the future of so many of these countries. Now I'm gonna remove my video. Yes, I've done it. And move forward, I hope you can still hear me. Utrent is in the center of the Mediterranean. It's an extraordinarily beautiful place. You can see it featured here at the end of Lake Butrent, looking towards Corfu. It's close to southern Italy. It was on the sea routes from Greece and uh, further east, going to Italy, up to Venice, and out to Sicily. It's a place that's known uh, through Virgil's Aeneid, where he claims Aeneas visited uh, uh, other Trojan exiles at the site. The setting at the end of a lake, a lagoon in marshland at the foot of the mountains is simply spectacular. It's also on the edge of what used to be uh, Turkey, Ottoman Turkey, so it attracted in the early 19th century, British and French spies working with the Ottomans to try and understand the archeology span of these places. William Martin Leake, Francois Pouqueville, both of them provide detailed descriptions of Boutrint because of its connections with Aeneas. But the first excavations began in the late 1920s under the Italians, Luigi Maria Ugolini, was uh, funded by the Italian Ministry of Foreign Affairs to essentially build a project here that associated Boutrint and its Virgilian connection to Rome at the time that Mussolini was the Duce. It was explicitly a political project, but M Ugolini was an excellent archeologist uh, and published a good deal of his work before he died rather too young at the age of 41 in 1937. In the Second World War, it was completely cut off. And then after the Second World War, in 1945, Enver Hoxha took over Albania with a strict Stalinist creed uh, and remained in control till his death in the 1980s. Here you can see two pictures of him one with Nikita Khrushchev, who came to the site and said to Hodja, it will be a great place to build a submarine base to destroy the West. And the second where Hodja is actually telling Khrushchev and Brezhnev off for not being Stalinist enough. This was so-called paradise on earth, but by the late 1980s, Albania, isolated as it was, was impoverished. In this period, post-war period, there was a good deal of archaeology and rather good archaeology, not least by Demostin Budina with the, with the Soviets. And here you see on the right hand side, uh, Neratan Seka, perhaps the best known of Albanian archaeologists visiting us when we were excavating at Butrint. They published a good deal and that's what made it an attractive site to take on archaeologically. In 1993, in the, in the left-hand figure, you can see to the right, Lord Jacob Rothschild, to the left, Lord uh, Sainsbury of the supermarket magnets, and in between them, Jim Wolfenson of the World Bank. They decided to try and help Albania by helping the archeological site. And that's where we began an archeological project. They had no sense then of anything other than discovery, uh, I will talk now for 10 minutes about the discoveries and then turn to the management issues. 
The project was extremely difficult to begin with. There was no meeting of minds. Basically, they were communists, we were neoliberals in the first four years. There was then uh, a civil war in 97. In 98, there was a new government. Uh, um, in that government was Edi Rama, who's pictured here, the now prime minister of Albania. And I worked with him to try and define the making of the park. And then over the following decade or so, we built uh, the infrastructure, not enough. And so we've returned to that, as I will describe, for a new plan. Uh, and the last part will be about that plan. But before I describe all the management and conservation issues, <coughs> I think it's important to make the point that Boutrent like Pompeii, like Rome, like anywhere in the Mediterranean, is a place that has a long stratified palimpsestic history. It was a Bronze Age site, an archaic Greek site, a sanctuary, a Republican colony, a bishopric. Uh, it then became a small post-Roman site, then a new town, a Venetian port with fish houses, and then an Ottoman fortress. First and foremost, the environmental context changed continuously, as all our research in, the, in Lake Boutrint has shown. And then we've been able to demonstrate how the, how the archaeological sites, such as the Bronze Age sites in the, in the Trojan Age, in the age of the wars of Troy, actually fitted in around the large embayment that was there. And equally, with the rise of Corfu as one of the greatest places in the Mediterranean, the Manhattan of the Mediterranean in the 6th century BC, little of which can be seen today, Boutrent became part of its territory, and there a small sanctuary was made, which was then turned into a larger wall center under Pyrrhus, him of the victory. And here you can see an image of Pyrrhus at the beginning of the third century with the theater that he constructed in the center of, of ancient Boutrint. The Romans took this landscape in 167 away from the Greeks and turned it into Roman Greece. They then fortified it with lots of small farms. And then they set up a veterans colony at the end of the first century in the era of Julius Caesar at Boutrint. The first town was a magnificent place and we've excavated large parts of it underwater for the most part because of the changing environmental circumstances. But Ugolini back in the 20s was the first to point out that it had one of the great assemblages of sculptures of the time. Now we can situate those sculptures not just in the buildings they came from, but in terms of the settlement structure, in terms of the environmental context, and begin to build a political and economic and social history for the area. With it went a new bridge, a massive new bridge, and a colony out in the fields where we excavated, and beyond that, the fields and farms were set within centuriation where there was essentially a very intensive agricultural uh, production. With that too, there were new villas like this one of the Pomponi that we excavated on Lake Boutrint, that's probably the, the home of the nephew of one of the most famous of all Roman writers, Titus Pomponius Atticus. There's a view of those excavations. And simply to make the point, a point which is rarely made that every generation, every color here in this planned excavation, now published in three volumes, every color represents a different generation, rebuilding, 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 rebuilding. So when you go to the average Greco-Roman town, you're looking at a snapshot that the archeologists have created uh, artificially through something that was a palimpsest. A palimpsest that included cemeteries, that included its own, uh, uh, own catastrophes. For example, there was a massive earthquake in the third century and an even more massive one in the fourth century that caused uh, essentially the forum floor to subside and the water table to rise by about a meter. There was a revival in the fifth century with new palaces, but this new palace was never completed. Uh, the water obviously got to it sometime in the fifth century. 
And then there became a bishopric in the sixth century with a wonderful baptistry, which I'll return to in a while that was excavated first by Ugolini and has perhaps the finest mosaic floor in the Balkans. At the same time, alongside the baptistry, you can see the very simple houses, a decline in house construction, and outside and around more churches with floors, including in abandoned villas, such as this one uh, that I showed you earlier on Lake Boutrent. From the 550s after the pandemic of 541, there is an enormous number of urban burials. And one thing is certain, and it's a metaphor for our times, collapse took less than 20 years. They have been arguing for centuries about what happened to Mediterranean archaeological towns, great towns, great Greco-Roman towns. There is not a snowball's chance in a Texas desert that any of them outlived really the early 7th century. Urban decline, once you have measured archaeology, is absolutely transparent from all the archaeology we have here and now in neighboring sites. A town that had numbered thousands came back to be just three or four towers that were destroyed in a feud. Uh, here's some of the bomb pots from this late 8th century feud. And then they moved out into the, into the plain, presumably to find a new settlement, to define it where they stayed in rather primitive circumstances, uh, but nevertheless had trading connections to the east and up into Italy with the remains of many seals and dozens of coins besides ceramics. The new town was created sometime in the late 10th century and in the 11th century it was furnished with new walls all made of earlier walls and the bridge was now broken and so you can see a wall going over the Roman bridge. A new church and a modest scale was built inside, rather like a cuckoo in the great basilica, and new townhouses were built, poor in quality, but rich in material culture. It featured in the Fourth Crusade. It was rebuilt in the 13th century, but on a more modest scale. It had churches with uh, frescoes such as these right by the theater. And it became, in effect, as, as Corfu grew under the Venetians, Corfu's protector on the mainland and a fortress of some substance. In the 16th century, in the, again in the early 18th century, Ottoman armies passed this way to try and crush Corfu, they failed. And there the Venetian castle on the, on the landscape remained a kind, uh, on the opposite Boutrint, remained a kind of outlier, a bulwark against the Ottomans as, as uh, increasingly they became more active. Finally, with the end of the Venetians, one of the greatest of empires in the the Ottomans took over the area, refurbished it with small castles to keep the British out. I've gone through a huge amount of archaeology, masses of uh, different periods, uh, we've excavated with hundreds of people and much of it is now published in a series of volumes. In essence, you can see that this was a place in history, first in a riverine corridor, the Pavlis River, and then in a Mediterranean context. Everyone thinks of the Mediterranean as a permanent and continuous uh, routeway connection networked, but it wasn't so. In the Bronze Age, as in the Ottoman era, the axes of connections, of trade, of relationships were up and down this corridor. Let's now turn to the issues in hand, and I'll briefly go through the different issues. Interpreting Boutrint, what I've just described to you very, very quickly is a 21st century description based on stratigraphic excavations, based on uh, looking at a site in terms of its context, in terms of its region, in terms of its inter-regional connections. The Albanians basically wanted it to be an Illyrian site, that is to give, uh, give substance to their own myths that they, the Albanian people, grew up uh, as a people who were separate in Enver Hodges' uh, paradise. This, of course, is a complete myth. There's nothing archaeological from Boutrint 
that is uh, uh, Illyrian uh, and uh, the only thing that is of substance is a long inscription that Ember Hodger had put up uh, to make his point that this was an Illyrian site. When UNESCO inscribed it, they said it had been inhabited since prehistoric times. Butrint has been the site of a Greek colony, a Roman city and a bishopric following a period of prosperity under Byzantine administration, brief occupation by the Venetians, it was abandoned to the marshes. What they're actually saying is, it was a late Bronze Age site of some substance, but they didn't really understand what that meant, that it was never a Greek, uh, substantial Greek colony. What it was, was an Epirot town and sanctuary that became a Roman colony and sub subsequently a bishopric. It did prosper under the Byzantines, but the Venetians conquered it and held it for a lot longer. The city then became part and parcel of the Ottoman world. You can tell from this UNESCO inscription that it wasn't written by, uh, as, let's say, a group of uh, scholars, and it was written with a very particular ac accent to its interpretation. What we set out to do was to look at the corrupting sea, uh, the great sea, the middle sea connections through Ferdinand Brodel's uh, vision prism of a place that had a changing rhythm and relationship to its, its circumstances. I've already mentioned the history of the project. The first period, <coughs> we simply couldn't make head or tail of how to deal with the Albanians, uh, and they couldn't make head or tail of how to deal with us. They seemed to us uh, to come from another world, and they did. And it took us a long time to find the right way to move forward. So they had no interest in actually doing anything other than protect it as a place where you had access to dig, to discover. Uh, they had no interest in conservation, except as a way of gaining money from other parties, such as the EU or USA, USA AID. We then put together with the World Bank and the Getty uh, grant program, the making of a park and we developed it. Uh, and I'm going to talk a little bit about each of those. This proved to be fairly successful. I don't say it's wholly successful by about 2012, which is when the Boutrint Foundation stepped back to really support Albanians doing this. And then the Albanian government through the American Albanian uh, Development Foundation approached us to work on the 2020-30 plan. And that plan, if it comes off, has huge implications now than ever with this pandemic, as I'll say. We've done the traditional scholarship there are, there are a huge number of publications on Boutrint as a result of our project. Academic, popular, guidebooks, all sorts of different forms in English, in Albanian, in Italian, all to make the place better known. <coughs> we curated the finds, we curated the archives. Essentially, this is one of the best curated sites of its kind. We've done the traditional scholarship, we had a summer school for a dozen years and trained 500 plus Albanian archaeologists, producing a textbook, enabling them to go on to work in to modern standards all across Albania. But the scars of communism and the transition economy were immense. When we got there, the intention was to build, as they called it, L'America, after the name of a film. They wanted to cover Boutrint with uh, 25,000 worth of beds, hotels, uh, supermarkets, golf courses. of employment and income, but in terms of identity for the culture. And so that's what we said to do. And probably the uh, interesting statement I can tell you is that when the Prime Minister of Albania went to Ottawa, Canada, 
in 2000. The Canadian Prime Minister uh, complimented him on having such a beautiful capital uh, that he'd heard about called Boutrint. Uh, in other words, it started to give identity to uh, the country as a whole. And that was our goal uh, in making this management plan supported by the World Monuments Fund, the Getty Organization and so forth. We began with a Getty workshop, which essentially looked at what visitors wanted. Here you can see a picture commemorating this. There were about 40 Albanians who took part, and we asked them what made Butrin special. And to the six teams, including one with the Minister of Culture, all came up with the conclusion that it was magical. It was magical to them because it had been off limits in the communist period and it was magical to us because it remained essentially a protected and beautiful lakeland, lagoonland uh, environment. So our goal was to sustain this, this spirit of place and at the same time to build a project around it that would allow them to develop tourism. So working with UNESCO, we in, after 1997, when there was a world, it became a World Heritage Site in danger, thanks to the Civil War. In two years later, with, with their support, we enlarged the boundaries to make a buffer zone that you can see here in green. And then we worked with Ramsar to enlarge it still further. The commission, UNESCO Commission of 2010, ratified all of this and supported it. And then in 2020, the new plan presented to UNESCO, which I'll talk about in a moment, essentially ratifies the concept of the whole area and enlarges it, it, enlarges it so that all the different parts are zoned and protected in a specific way. From 2000, we made a park with a park office at Saranda, the nearby town and in Butrint itself, responsible for the enlarged area. But I feel in retrospect, and I've written uh, in several places, that we didn't do enough in terms of capacity building. To us, we simply couldn't overcome uh, the, the cultural differences. Uh, nevertheless, the park, uh, soon had a big impact. Uh, you can see that we we had to generate tourist revenues to begin with. As uh, Padma said at the beginning, there were about a thousand tourists. Gradually, thousands came. Uh, and uh, what was important to us, not just, not just foreigners coming from Corfu, but also promoting Boutrint to Albania. So Miss uh, Shipria was the first big event we did in 2000 and we went on to do operas there, in a sense, to make the Albanians believe in the place as they've come to do, because it's the place now where you get married in Albania, and therefore to protect it symbolically within their world, within their culture. That protection is in a sense uh, embodied in the biggest note that you can get in Albania, the 2000 lek, uh, and here on this lek bank, banknote remembering Gladiator, you, you got uh, what they describe as an amphitheater. It's actually a uh, theater, but nevertheless, it serves the point. We then had to manage tourism. The first signs we put up in 1976, some survived out of sheer shock because no one had ever seen signage in an archaeological site. No Albanian archaeologist had ever offered that kind of information to Albanian visitors. We, uh, we managed to salvage some of those signs. Some ended up being kitchen tables, some were cut up for other things. And then in the 2000s, as tourism got underway, working with Italian designers, we created new signage that has in Albanian and in English that has stood the test of time and been copied by all the sites in Albania. In that time, the, the visitor numbers have grown dramatically. I haven't shown this, this uh, uh, graph doesn't do justice to it. As in all of these sites in the Mediterranean until this year, growth was a minimum of 5% and sometimes up to 7, 8%, destroying many sites simply because there are too many tourists. The tourism created a multiplier effect in terms of local production, 
cheese and there's a wrapper to the right, uh, a little uh, catch catch keys, uh, and so on, that uh, in effect began to give employment to local people in a tasteful way. At the same time, however, as is uh, as is was and has been rampant in many of these Mediterranean archaeological sites, ticket revenue became a subject of corruption. So our first project with the Albanian American Development Fund to put in new electronic gates and to control and manage the revenues so the revenues might be expended on maintaining the sites. We did a huge project leading to work with ICROM on the conservation, thanks to the man in the far left here, Telemark Lacano, who was the local member of the Institute of Monuments. He was the one in 1995 who encouraged us to work on veg vegetation management to do the uh, <coughs> condition survey that went into the management plan and then to create recreate the reversible wall conservation strategies in the and the paint and the fresco strategies that had in the past been known but never implemented and so over the last 20 years annually there has been miles of the walls have been refurbished repointed uh, and restored the mosaics equally have been uh, benefited from the same strategy. The mosaic pavement to the baptistry, perhaps the most mo famous mosaic pavement in the Balkans, was initially <coughs> uh, a, a, an attraction to all sorts of conservators who saw that they might build a roof over it and have some kind of pump system because water comes here in the winter time, et cetera, et cetera. I won't go into the detail, but the long and the short of it is we stuck to a strategy where it's uh, covered with sand, where it's maintained by trained mosaicists, mosaicists that we trained, uh, and a, a system of training capacity building that began here has been implemented in all the other mosaics at Boutrint. We conserved many of the excavations, backfilling them, <coughs> covering the mosaics, having conserved them, uh, working on the walls, and basically turning them into part and parcel of the overall program with trails that link them, boat trails, boat, uh, boat uh, journeys, and so on and so forth. The long and the short of this is that most archeologists hate to see their excavations backfilled, but if we hadn't done it, these places would be gaping holes as there were many gaping holes when we arrived at Butrin. The site museum in the castle was abandoned when we got there, being built by Ugolini in 88, refurbished in 80, uh, 88. Uh, it was made in 38, refurbished in 88, and little in 95. So we completely redid it in 2005 and made it for visitors who might come to understand a Mediterranean place as opposed to an Albanian citadel. I suspect many of you do not know what Albania looks like. Most of you would recognize a Mediterranean site that has connections to Pompeii or to Ephesus, to Knossos or so on. We worked to get back all the looted objects that had been lost in the anarchy uh, uh, in the period. This one came from New York. We made hiking trails, but the Albanians in, 19, in 2005 weren't really into hiking. Uh, and so uh, as yet, that hasn't got off the ground. Why? Because there were a thousand vehicles in the country in, um, in the 1990 when it became a democracy. Everyone wanted a car. Uh, and it had the highest number of stolen Mercedes in the world by 1995. Everyone would drive if they could drive at all. But the hiking trails through this landscape now with a new generation have a certain importance that we'll come back to. We built local partnerships, working with foundations, school with WorldMate, and we work with community projects to get the communities to to make objects for make objects grow grow materials for <coughs> sale at the park. 
And we then analyzed all this. A Stanford student did a community survey, which became a PhD, to understand in particular how the local communities saw Boutrin and in particular how they registered uh, the, the changes that we have made. Lastly, we worked with the Albanian government on getting UNESCO status for the neighboring town of Giracastra so that we could begin to create a heritage network. Now, all of this, to be honest with you, was an uphill struggle. And in many ways, my Stanford PhD student called us neoliberals and neocolonialists uh, at times teasing me. But nevertheless, encouraged by Eddie Rama, who you see here, <coughs> we started to realize that we had to pass the mantle over to the Albanians. And in passing the mantle over to the Albanians, you realize that they, in the country that is trying, a transition economy that's trying to build a future, it's hard for them to understand the kinds of standards that, for example, UNESCO or the EU want to see expended in archaeological sites, their conservation and their management. Other issues, all too obvious, become compelling. But as tourism grew, Rama grasped that it was essential that he work to understand and appreciate, as he puts it in this little text, the other's house, because everyone initially was, for understandable reasons, just trying to survive and interested in their own house. So the Albanian American Development Foundation approached the Boutrint Foundation and hired a British conservation team, Prince and Pierce, David Prince and Simon Pierce, with a great deal of national and international experience, to look at the next decade of Boutrint. What the Minister of Culture was charged by Rama to do was to ask how can we leverage and at the same time conserve this place so that it may, we make sure that it, can, it has the best uh, conservation as an asset into the future on the one hand and on the other hand generates income for the future. At the moment in 2018-19 Visitor numbers were around 300,000, far in excess of what we, as the Boutrint Foundation, had anticipated. And growing, as I said earlier on, as all Mediterranean sites are seeing a, were seeing a growth. How could that be sustained to help a larger tourist program for Albania to create, above all else, the impact of employment? Rama had already set about selecting a hundred villages in Albania to have those villages conserved. He worked on the Riviera coastline to the north to protect it and to try and build uh, some sort of capacity there to make Albania a relatively cheap tourist destination, <coughs> but also one that was deeply attractive to international tourism and therefore, through its identity, would attract business relationships, and therefore, through that, get Albania uh, entry into the European Union. That's Rama's strategy. The Prince and Pierce plan, very simply, which I'll take you through for five minutes, begins on the issue of governance. A new Boutrint Foundation and argues that there should be an NGO managing Boudrint with the Ministry of Culture simply one member of the executive management board of that NGO. This is a revolution in Mediterranean uh, archaeological sites. No one, no one in Italy could imagine an NGO outside the government managing Pompeii. It is simply beyond their imagination. No one in Greece could imagine the Parthenon being managed by anyone under the Ephoria, the government. Ministries of culture have run these places since time immemorial, and in particular in recent generations, have set out to use them to get tourists on the one hand, and income through conservation uh, consultancies and expenditure on the other. They haven't thought about their larger 
uh, the larger issue of their impact in, ter in terms of territory and in terms of identity. So the governance is still holding up uh, whether the Prince and Pierce plan goes through, though it's been to the, minister, uh, to the Council of Ministers and be been pan passed during this uh, pandemic. What was accepted <coughs> after some debate was an enhanced reversible conservation strategy for 10 years, which is quite expensive. Uh, and what was uh, essentially sidelined and forgotten was all thought of rebuilding parts of Butrint so that visitors might find some Disneyland uh, at Butrint. We made the point, Prince and Pierce made the point, that in effect people come to see ruins in this extraordinary natural landscape, that's what UNESCO inscribed, that's how it should stay, and the conservation should be developed to that end. Part of the, pr the plan is increased capacity training, in particular in terms of management of a business plan, and then in a more specific sense, the creation of a visitor center so that it becomes the entry to a larger buffer zone with uh, hiking trails and visits to the other major archaeological sites which have been wholly in Butrin's shadow, other archaeological sites in the, in the Pavlos Valley. Introduction of electric buses to stop all the car traffic and the creation, as I've said already, of a network of sites. Here you can see the simple map that uh, Prince and Pierce have put forward, uh, in essence trying to work on the main sites with a budget of in excess of 20 million. A snapshot of the plan uh, and in essence their aims is to make it one of the great cultural landscapes recognized by a host of generations, by a host of organizations and to fulfill in a sense, that goal which we set out as the Butrint Foundation to make it a flagship for Albania. It basically improves access, it provides an enjoyable and rewarding experience for visitors. We may well, if it comes off, try and work with all sorts of virtual reality technologies if it's possible. Uh, and above all else, it's anticipated we have to manage the 300,000 foot traffic uh, if, uh, if after the pandemic all returns well. It's anticipated that all of this will start next spring, but I can't see with the pandemic that happening. And in essence, the key issue is the business plan and the delivery of the business plan on the site, which makes sure that all the legal and political issues <coughs> are dealt with. Most of all, it means uh, a, an expenditure of 17 million plus 8 million that will come from reserves so that it will generate roughly 2 million a year and in, in effect, uh, all the investment will be repaid after 2025. It's a very Anglophone style of plan that will result in the best conservation and it will ensure that the park and the site have essentially a status uh, locally and internationally. And above all else, and I put this as a separate, site, separate slide, it will ensure, as it should ensure, a large number of full-time equivalent jobs. Now, there are many issues. The resolution of land ownership, since all land was taken by the communists when they came to power, and the, most of all, the need for a new authority to oversee the site and its wider national park. That authority, who does that, how it's done, is still the subject of much debate. But uh, in this schematic way, uh, the goal of the Prince and Piers plan is to make Butrint a pilot project that then one imagines other Balkan ministries of culture or the or the Greek or the, uh, uh, or the Italian Ministry of Culture will look at and say, wow, this is a global leader in sustainable management of a mixed cultural and national natural site. <coughs> so to end, 
what this vision calls for is an encapsulation of the integrated management plan that's consistent with UNESCO's 2030 agenda for sustainable development. Being passed by the Rama's Council of Ministers, but it remains now to see if it will come to pass. And that, it seems to me, is the crux that this pandemic has brought before us. And so I'll end on this thought. I'm associated with many sites in, in Italy and, uh, and in Greece, and many of them are deteriorating because of the management uh, challenges that are faced in each and every one of them. They need to be thought of in a different way. They need to be thought of, obviously, for the conservation uh, circumstances, which demand that these places need to be protected on the one hand as foot traffic grows, as the number of tourists uh, excel and grow to numbers that were never previously imagined. And on the other hand, uh, are used in a strategic way to develop economic development in countries that so badly need it. In Greece, uh, cultural heritage and, and obviously seaborne tourism <coughs> amounts to an excess of 20% of Greece's tourism, of Greece's income. Italy, it's roughly the same. This pandemic has exposed the vulnerability through the absence of tourists to these places. And so there is no doubt that if we wish to keep these economies moving forward, we have to take account of the important of importance of tourism. But ministries of tourism invariably are at the bottom of the pile and not the kinds of engines that look after, for example, the oil industry. They need to be refurbished, reformed, and made into more important uh, institutions that actually can call upon trained personnel Man to manage their assets as one would manage assets in any other walk of life. The Albanian American Development Foundation introduced to Albanian modern insurance policies and it built the new airport to take two examples, but it has found itself utterly astonished at the extraordinary conflict over losing national, over the government losing uh, as it appears national control over its greatest archaeological site. So we are at a crossroads, a point of inflection that the pandemic in a sense has accentuated. In accentuating it, we've got time to actually think about the importance of looking forward to the next decade and I certainly hope that working with a lot of young talented trained Albanians who've now had experience abroad, there is a chance some 27 years after we started at Butrin to make it one, not just one of the most magical places in the Mediterranean, which true is, but also to make it a that allows everyone to take advantage of it as a place to guide work south of the Albanian border or west of the Albanian border in neighboring countries like Greece and Italy. Anyway, I thank you. I've talked far too much, but I hope I've given you a few ideas uh, about this place and its, and its importance. <coughs> thank you very much, Dr. Hodges. Yes, thank you. I switched off your video at the end of it. Sorry. I think, um, I think it's all right. Is it voice, coming back? This was not clear. Yeah, yeah, it was good. We could hear you. The presentation worked very well. Thank you so much. I really wish the project the best and hopefully it should pick up post pandemic as everything else, which is waiting for the thing to end. Indeed. Questions? Uh, if we can take questions uh, if you have time, but I don't see any questions. Any questions? Any comments? No, I don't see any questions. Too much, too fast. <clears throat> but I, there's oh, a big I think, story. I think, no. Well, th um, thank you very much anyway, Padma. Oh, thank Padma, you. Oh, Padma, there are questions. Are they? Sorry. Yeah. 
Thank you, Anupam. I missed that. Uh, yes, there's a question. What is reverse conservation? That's Anupam. Thanks, Anupam. What is this reverse conservation? Can yes, I can me? hear you. In, es yeah. in essence, reversible conservation means that you're making, essentially, you're using lime in the case of walls to be very precise. You're making, you're conserving something that can be uh, reversed and taken back again. You're not actually changing it permanently forever. <coughs> in other words, <coughs> excuse my cough. In other words, there had been a tradition in the Mediterranean of using cement. And what we've returned to is using the kind of uh, technologies that were used before so that there is nothing that's uh, that is permanent in the way that the that for example walls are made and that means in effect that you not only have to continually monitor those walls but you have to make sure that there is enough materials to keep repairing them every few years the re reversibility is part and parcel now of unesco strategies on all these sites but until very recently, wasn't implemented in many of them. Okay. Thank you. The next question is, I wonder if you could speak a bit about the strategy of backfilling the mosaics. Uh, the mosaics, you mentioned the pushback from archaeologists. Was there from locals as well, this pushback? Good question. Um, there was pushback. Uh, we excavated large areas, many large areas, and there have been many previous large areas excavated. There's a large part of Boutrin which is open to the public. So what we did was select, working with our conservation architects, those sites which could be presented to visitors and presented coherently to visitors and the others which could not we recovered having made a full record of them we recovered them having also conserved the uh, mosaics and buried them uh, following the standard techniques employed by the community that work on the society that works on mosaic protection <clears throat> very simply was there pushback Yes, many of the archaeologists hate to see their holes filled in. From a wider public, not really, uh, because they didn't appreciate, uh, in a sense, that what had been buried. But many mosaics are simply too fragile to leave open, and there simply isn't the capacity to manage them. And I would, in terms of that, give you the illustration of Pompeii. By, in 1970, when I went to Pompeii, there were 50 houses open and 100 people working there. 10 years ago, there were 10 houses open and 1,000 people working there, and 40 houses were in need of repair. In other words, we, they didn't have the capacity to actually manage the constant maintenance of mosaics and frescoes. Well, when we reburied these sites, and not all of them, as I said at the beginning, we made sure that we were at the same time working to build capacity in Albania. And I suspect by 2030, there will be sufficient capacity to expose many of the mosaics that we uh, buried before and carefully buried. Thank you. The next question is, was there ever a debate on whether to inscribe the site as a cultural landscape? Um, yes, there was. Uh, and it's, and I, I, to be honest with you, uh, it, it's not inscribed properly as that at the moment, and it should be. And why wasn't it? And that the answer is, if you look at the inscription that I showed you, it was seen in terms of that old fashioned archeological concept of art and architecture, monument, as opposed to a place. 
it wasn't seen in terms of a place in an environment in a landscape a landscape which has a changing has had a changing environment and indeed includes two great greek sites so there's in in the landscape so it's not been entirely understood because you are making a big shift in not just the archaeological paradigm but also the conservation paradigm from a world that focuses on Greco-Roman sites as monuments to uh, seeing them instead as places uh, in the Brodelian Mediterranean case. And that is a big shift that hasn't yet fully occurred. So people go to the Parthenon, for example, or to the Colosseum, and they see these as monuments <clears throat> as opposed to places within a larger, changing, evolving uh, city in, in, in antiquity. A place in the case of the Parthenon that became at one point a church, another point a fortress, a case in the case of the Colosseum that became a castle, a church, and so forth. In other words, uh, we've, <coughs> we've got to understand place better if we're going to really develop cultural landscapes uh, to be more than just environmental context. Thank you. The next question is, what was the impact on land prices after your project? That is a good question. <laughs> land is still a big issue. Uh, land prices, in effect, are in abeyance because all the land was uh, taken by the government in 1945 and only gradually returned to the their owners so that's the first point and in returning it to their owners none of them have sold their land now were we to purchase the land <coughs> to build the visitor center or for example to do another project i don't doubt they will see, as they say in Italian, the, uh, the American uncle, uh, they will see the opportunity to inflate the prices. And that's one of the mediation issues that has yet to be resolved, uh, as I pointed out in the slides. I think with time, uh, the value of land will go up uh, and the value of village houses will go up as the concept, for example, that was utterly incomprehensible in, 2000, in 1995, 1994, the concept of Airbnb suddenly becomes apparent, uh, linked not just to Boutrint, but also to the prospects of walking in blissful uh, countryside such as around there. So uh, there are, the next decade is going to see a lot of challenges like that. Thank you. Next question is, how will the interest in the site now alter the traditional housing design in the area? Did you have to make any plans for revitalization or conservation of water bodies in the area as well? We didn't. We didn't go that far. It's a very good question. It's a very good question because the, this was an area that was famous for epiro vernacular houses that are really rather spectacular as in the World Heritage City of Girocastra. Each village had such houses. But the area we're in was a buffer area in which, in effect, uh, communists that were thrown out of Greece were planted to make sure that Albanians didn't escape to Greece. And their houses are very poor quality. So as immediately they started enhancing them in the uh, rather <coughs> a rather, uh, how shall I say, cheap and not terribly attractive way. I think that's an issue, an important issue, that will come up as the consequences of developing the, the Pavlos Valley and the cultural landscape take shape. How will each of these village houses be looked at? That hasn't happened, but it should happen. That's a good question. 
Thank you. The next question is, how exactly was the local community involved and encouraged to participate in the entire process? Again, a good question. <clears throat> the local community had played, and I'm talking about the very local community around Butrint, no part in its history until we got there, ever. It was in effect the property of the Institute of Archaeology and you had to go there with a permit because it was in this buffer zone near the border. When we started, we had to work with the national authorities, but we also worked with the local town authorities, Saranda, hence that Getty workshop was in Saranda with, with Saranda uh, involvement. The truth is we tried to get local involvement and in some cases we got individuals, but at the present time, it's a very top-down society. So one of the aspects of the Prince and Pierce project is to build more local capacity. This is important. There is some now, it's growing, but I don't want to exaggerate it. Now, in saying all of that, we, one of my students, as I mentioned, uh, wrote a PhD for Stanford, and which she saw, she showed that the locals were very much in favor of what we had done, but felt that the Albanian authorities had ignored them. And she made a very good case for involving them. David Prince, I know, is keen to do this because it is, it's a very Anglo-Saxon way of proceeding. Whether it can proceed easily remains to be seen. Our first attempts, some worked, some didn't, but the long and the short of it is any archaeological site depends as much upon its local community as it does upon its national community. It's the relationship between the two that matters. And what most local communities regret is where they've been forgotten by the national uh, government or its agencies and they feel alienated. That's certainly the case at the present time. So that's part and parcel of the next 10 year plan. Thank you. I think there was a part in the first question uh, that we missed out. Are there any plans to revitalize or conserve the water bodies in the area? Uh, that's the water. The water is a huge issue. The let's be clear. Our archaeological environmental studies showed how that landscape had changed over the last four thousand years. It's not been static. The Albanian authorities then drained it in the 1960s and put in drainage channels with pumps. The pumps failed in 1990, 91, because they didn't have the diesel to run them. So it's returned to being a marshland. The return of the water levels has brought more water seasonally into Butrint. So the baptistry pavement in the depths of the winter is under water, for example. That is the challenge. The cavea of the theater is under water constantly. So uh, the challenge would be to build new pumps <coughs> and change the physiology of the water system or to leave it as it is. We brought in uh, many different water experts and they all pushed us, argued to us, to leave it as it is. The water's not unduly acidic, it doesn't attack the monuments, uh, and it does bring an incredible uh, natural uh, community in terms of birds to the area. It also adds to the uh, extraordinary landscape. But what it means is that the water within the archaeological it has to be constantly managed and and under our uh, uh, under our circumstances was that's again part of the challenge for the coming uh, plan to make sure that that constant management including checking on the on the character of the water is is maintained because to build new pumps as many people thought to do initially would again 
change the landscape in ways that are difficult to predict. Thank you. Next question is uh, more like a thing is it like most people criticize reversibility in conservation in contemporary debates. Your comments or your stand on that? I, I think making anything, any kind of conservation that can be uh, checked and, and altered having been properly um, studied and uh, what's the word recorded uh, is the way forward. What we found when we got there was the use of a lot of concrete, which wasn't reversible which meant that you have to, you have in a sense, fake walls. Uh, and very soon, when you come to record those walls, for example, you can't determine what is fake from what is original uh, in terms of how the concrete was used. It therefore makes reading the walls as an archeologist almost impossible. The walls are archeological. They need to be maintained in a way uh, that can be recorded as part and parcel of the history of the place. So I've, I've worked with lots of conservators, principally Italians, to be honest with you, but also Albanians and Greeks at Butrent, uh, and, and also the Israeli Antiquities Authority also did a training project on the mosaics. So I've, I've simply learned from them, and I'm just echoing what they said. But we've had huge number of team. We also ran an ICROM course there for three years, run, I should say, ultimately by Albanians for Albanians, which made it rather good. Thank you. The next question is regarding over tourism. Are there any checks and indicators recommended for the way forward to reduce the negative impacts that generally come with over tourism? No, not really. <clears throat> No, there's, that's part and parcel of the plan. There need to be new paths. There need to be ways of managing volume. Uh, but as in all Greco-Roman sites in the Mediterranean, uh, with the exception these days of the Colosseum where you have to book, uh, just the long lines to come it's necessary to treat this in a different way. And I think the pandemic has taught everyone that's, that's part and parcel of the future. Uh, I, I gave a very black and white view of it. I do think the Italian authorities in Pompeii, for example, are learning how to manage footfall, the numbers, but it's, we've still a long way to go in, in terms of, of really managing sites. And if, any, if there's any good that comes out of the pandemic, I think it is that many sites and museums have now opened, recognizing that they have to manage social distance and therefore they have to look at numbers in a, in a new way. So uh, to answer this question specifically, it's very much in the minds of Prince and Pierce that you can't have 10,000 people at Boutrint on, a, on an August morning. You need far fewer or you need to disperse them. The question is building the strategy to do that. Okay. Thank you. So our last comment from Anupam regarding the water, he says, so it may qualify as a wetland area. That's an important natural asset. That's a comment from him regarding the thing. Other questions. Uh, it also means other than numbers for tourism, what impacts do you think it will have on the local community? The negative impacts on the local communities. Um, have, have there been any indicators or checks recommended for that, apart from the numbers of tourists? The, uh, the local communities plan, uh, they've yet to see implementation. The British team, uh, Prince and Pierce, are very keen to involve them, as I've said. Uh, there's no specifics yet, uh, but what one would hope, if I may say, is that somewhere that seems marginal to Albania, uh, in 
uh, Prime Minister is part and parcel of the identity of the country and therefore is not just a question of introducing new ideas. It's also a question of, of training and bringing in, for example, as we are now using digital, digital assets, digital methods to connect them to the larger Albania and therefore through those connections to make it possible for this landscape to operate in the winter as a place, which it doesn't at the moment. So North European tourists escape their winter to go to uh, Italian cities or Spanish cities, but it's perfectly conceivable that they could go to the Mediterranean to go walking or to go bird watching. In the case of Butrint, it's a secondary migratory route. And it, none of this has been really developed to the extent it needs to be in the Mediterranean. The Greek government has just started to talk of winter tourism, but it's a novelty. Uh, as this pandemic uh, destroys our economies, it's going to become more than clear that you can use these assets, not just in the summer months, but also at other times of the year. Therefore, you need to work with the local communities to make that happen. You don't close all the restaurants. You don't, you have opportunities for accommodation and so on and so forth. Hi, Gail. Uh, we have Gail Negushnye with us. Gail, do you want to comment? No, I, I just enjoyed. You listen. just enjoyed? <laughs> it's very sad. Uh, you cover all fields and so on and give a good illustration, excellent illustration of uh, what can be done and what is unfortunately not done in so many places around the Mediterranean area. Well, just on the traditional way, you, you dig, you excavate, you don't conserve, you take money and you run away. That's very sad. So compliment Richard, but uh, how many years have you taken to <laughs> reach this level of, uh, and, and this excellent demonstration of capacity building and so on? How many years have you been working there? Repeat, because you have said it, but now it's interesting to repeat it, to remember that it takes time. It's it's taken us, Gail, 27 years, and at the moment, uh, I am I'm wearing two hats. I am finishing a huge book on the cultural landscape, which will be published at Christmas, because the Italians back in the 20s found two major archaeological cities in the shadow of Butrint, each bigger than Butrint, but no one ever goes to them. Beautiful places. And secondly, we are waiting on the Ministry of Culture in Albania to allow us to advance to the next step with the, with the plan. Whether that happens remains to be seen, but 27 years has gone by very quickly. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Um, I think we don't have any more questions. Thank you so much. Dr. Hodges for the lovely talk. Thank you very much. Thanks and thank you to us. everyone who listened. It's been a question. Thank you. Thank you so much for taking the time out. I know you're very busy and managed to do this for us. Thank you so much, everyone, for joining us. So it's bye. Thanks, Gail. Thanks, Claire. Bye bye. Bye. Bye bye. bye. All the best. Bye bye. Bye. -bye. bye, -bye.